David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, July 5th, 2022. The mute button is now working, and uh, we're ready to roll on another show. We are back after the 4th of July holiday weekend, because it's the, it's the 5th of July now. We've just told you so. Lots to catch up on. Golly. Well, of course, uh, once again, we get to uh, kick off the morning show post with the warning that we are under the cloud of a mass shooting. And, you know, we didn't even really get to process that one before we're on to the scare of another mass shooting, except this one a little bit weird and questionable. No doubt by this point you have already heard all about the actual mass shooting in Highland Park. Illinois, and there's a lot to talk about surrounding that, but I think probably having the uh, holiday weekend, well, yesterday anyway, to discuss it, probably, uh, you, you probably, probably got your fill of it, but yeah, it was kind of interesting, the things that we learned from this one. I guess the few notes I will mention on it, of course, are one, that uh, right-wing online Life, right wing Twitter uh, and whatever else they're using, social media, right wing social media immediately went to, well, you see Chicago and therefore blah, 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 blah. And uh, that one was very quickly debunked. I mean, it, I guess you can call it the Chicago area, but well, it's fairly well removed. I mean, it's a, I, I guess a, a, a far enough out exurb. I'm sure people are going to Chicago all the time, perhaps commuting to there. It's, but it's, I'll say this, uh, it's no more Chicago than my area is Washington, D.C. proper, for one thing. And lots of people pointing out, uh, very high class suburb. So if you were thinking of going the Chicago gangland, uh, route to try to somehow deny that this was an important event, I don't know why you would try and do that, but People do all sorts of things to distract attention from events like this. And people pointing out, well, uh, fairly well integrated into American society, uh, you, you might say, because um, apparently the uh, setting for or the shooting location for lots of 80s movies that would be very familiar to people of a certain age, but apparently... The uh, site, Highland Park, of location shoots for, oh, I don't know, let's see, Homes in Risky Business, Joel's Home in Risky Business, and Jake's Home from 16 Candles, and you get what kind of age I'm talking about here, uh, Gary's Home from Weird Science, Cameron's Home from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, that's the kind of place that we're talking about, not you know, gangland anywhere for that matter. I just thought it was very interesting. And of course, nice white suburban boy who apparently is the uh, shooter and all this. Very nice. He's so nice. Uh, you know, there'll be lots of stories about how he was a quiet loner and no one expected it. But uh, apparently he left the social media trail full of all the sorts of things that would make you say, oh yeah, I think I've got the right person's social media feed here. You never know. They came out with the kid's name. It doesn't make a great deal of sense to try to repeat it. It certainly seems like he was in it for the recognition. Although I will say I was wondering whether Oliver Willis thought this was one of his Matrix glitches that the kid's last name, it, I don't know, if, does he pronounce it this way? Is it Crimo? Like, are you really saying that the biggest crime of the day was committed by somebody named Crimo? I didn't, you know, I don't know. Anyway, a uh, big scare it caused there and everywhere. Uh, lots of stories about other uh, 4th of July events canceled as a result of the fears stoked by, well, you had to imagine one of these was coming at some point. Um, I guess I kind of figured that they would uh, there would be more of them during fireworks when there are already plenty of accidents from celebratory gunfire. People fire their guns either... Uh, because they love making loud noises at the same time that somebody else is making loud noises, or they think it's going to cover up the loud noises, but I think they like the, I don't know. 
I don't know if it's cover so much as that's when we celebrate and how we celebrate. We make loud noises. I haven't even looked uh, for the annual big night toll in celebratory gunfire, but the results usually don't come in for a day or two anyway for uh, the news stories to trickle through to our notice. But as I said, lots of other reaction to it. I just happened to see the Hill tweeting that uh, the Chicago White Sox canceled their July 4th fireworks after the Highland Park shooting, probably for a number of reasons, not the least of which, of course, is the loud noises are beginning to scare people as they've scared dogs for years. But uh, yeah, you can't blame people for thinking that they might be hearing something different. It's very difficult often to tell the difference between fireworks and gunshots. And as a matter of fact, um, I think I put aside in um, in, in pocket somewhere. Uh, oh, yes, here's is The Washington Post had an article on just this subject. Who are our writers here? Brian Pitch, P-I-E-T-S-C-H, Amy Chang, Katerina Ang, and Ellen Francis, a group project. On this one, uh, putting together the story under the headline, Chaos at July 4th Events as Fireworks are Mistaken for Gunshots. Now, there's video running beneath, which uh, is captioned, uh, as I'm sure many of you are waiting for me to get around to this story, Two Officers Shot, Crowd Flees During Philadelphia Concert. Well, the problem with this one is, it's not entirely clear what happened here. And as the headline suggests, there's the possibility that here and elsewhere, uh, fireworks or the similar fireworks or the like were mistaken for gunshots. Of course, it could also have been gunshots, either intentional, unintentional for that matter, celebratory. It's, it's just so hard to tell what's making that machine gun noise in my neighborhood. But uh, here we are. This story begins, scenes of chaos unfolded at July 4th celebrations. I'm sorry, 4th of July celebrations. Very fancy. In cities nationwide, as the booming sounds of fireworks fireworks were apparently mistaken for gunshots, sending scores of revelers fleeing for cover. I mean, it's a long time coming. I would have thought this would have happened every year, and it might happen on a small scale every year. But this year... It's likely to be worse because, of course, the number of mass shootings are, is going up. And we started the day with a mass shooting at a July 4th event. So that's going to have everyone on edge. But I've been wondering why it is that we don't worry about that more often. Anyway, crowds panicked and ran from loud noises in Orlando, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Washington, suggesting a nation on edge following a recent spate of high-profile mass shootings, including one Monday morning in Highland Park, Illinois, that killed six people. Well, it wasn't the shooting, the mass shooting event that killed them. It was one murderer. Oh, yes. By the way, my big my big observation. I mean, how do you make an observation on an event like this except to say, uh, gee whiz, I think there are too many of these things happening and we just kind of have to maybe put a damper on it at some point, possibly, like maybe talk about something tangentially related to it in some way. Anyway... My uh, big observation here was um, this was the first time in a long time that a mass shooting like this out in public, out in the open uh, with a big event going on, drawing lots of people, and then everybody hearing the number of shots that were fired. If you heard any of the videos or listened to any of the video or heard audio without the video of the event, there were lots of people who taped it on their phones, filmed it, and you can hear how many shots are fired. This is the first time in a long time that the shooting wasn't immediately followed by rumors that there were multiple gunmen because no one person could have fired so many shots in such a short amount of time. So there must be multiple shooters working together on this. And that's always been the big fear that it's some sort of coordinated terrorist attack. But that didn't happen this time, even though you can clearly hear something in the neighborhood of about 60 shots being fired in the short clips that I've seen. Uh, But it also makes it extraordinarily clear exactly what's going on here is that the shooter has 
30 round magazines. You can hear 30 shots more or less being fired. Uh, sometimes it overlaps a little bit, but if you're concentrating, you can count about 30 and then lo and behold, there's a gap of, oh, I don't know, a few seconds, maybe 10, and then another burst of 30 shots that comes through. And that's, of course, him changing magazines. He's firing and firing and firing until he has to stop because the magazine he has has run out of capacity. If he had a 100-round drum for his ammunition, there would have been 100 shots and then time to change and then 100 shots. Look, it's common sense. The bigger the magazines you give people, the more shots they're going to be able to fire uninterrupted. Uh, anyway, I just thought that was interesting that nobody bothered to make that mistake. We all now know and understand very clearly that any single shooter can find weapons that are capable of firing that many rounds that quickly all by yourself and you can buy it off the shelf and no modification to your weapon is necessary. It's just a plug and play situation. You can buy it and then you can be a machine gun mass murderer with no training whatsoever. So there you have it. I thought that was sort of an interesting development that nobody made that mistake. That was that was new, I thought, and interesting. Uh, all right, let's see. Other things. Uh, oh, yes, right. We were talking about the people mistakenly running from uh, what they thought was gunfire around the country. Let's see. Well, at any rate, then they turn, as I said, their attention to the one that was actually a mass shooting and... Uh, the governor of Illinois speaks on this one. It is devastating that a celebration of America was ripped apart by our uniquely American plague. That was well put. That's Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker on Monday. While we celebrate the 4th of July just once a year, mass shootings have become our weekly, yes, weekly American tradition. And really, honestly, they're behind the times and it's quite, um, quite nearly a daily situation. The bloodshed in the Chicago suburb of about 30,000 Shattered the 4th of July festivities. The aftermath of Highland Park's parade was not candy wrappers or loose streamers, but pooled blood and abandoned strollers after residents fled the scene, taking shelter for hours as a manhunt unfolded, which brings us, I guess, to point number two. I'm probably like point three and four, if I can squeeze them all in here. Uh, one, that uh, an interesting, non-traditional, although it's getting more frequent, ending to the mass shooting, not with the mass shooter turning the weapon on himself and ending his life or um, playing out the suicide by cop situation, but walking away. Apparently, the shooter decided, I don't know whether it was pre-planned or whatever, but it worked out very well for him, to shoot from the rooftops, the parade route along a main street business district with low-slung, single-story uh, sidewalk shops, you know, and uh, he climbed up on top of one of them. Uh, oh, yes, right. The police noted that uh, he made use of a ladder, which actually made it sound like it maybe was a fire escape ladder or something like that, uh, or you know, roof access ladder of some kind, which was unsecured and was available to him to climb up in, you know, from an alley behind one of these shops and get up on the roof and start shooting as though he were a sniper. Not a very good sniper. I mean, thank God, 60 rounds and... Uh, what, six people killed and 20-something injured, I think I read? And I hope that's the number because I was worried that the number would be much higher given what he was doing. But he wasn't, you know, I, it's just a matter of, I don't know, quibbling over the terminology. They, they're pointing out that he's taking a sniper position, but he's really, I think, quite clearly just spraying bullets at that point that the, the shots are coming so quickly. He's not aiming in any sense. But then again... That demonstrates the power of the AR-15. You really don't have to. You can fire so many bullets, you can just basically point it at a crowd and just squeeze the trigger as quickly as possible. Also pointing out, by the way, no need of a bump stock whatsoever in order to fire pretty much as though it was a machine gun. It was fairly clear from the audio that he wasn't using any sort of <clears throat> bump stock or artif other you know, device that would simulate automatic weapons fire but it was also equally clear if you listen that semi-automatic firing is quite enough and it might as well be you know it, it works 
quite as well as any machine gun. Well, yes, it's it's a lot faster certainly if you're firing on automatic, but uh, I don't I can't imagine any legitimate demand for faster firing. So let's not all get uh, up in arms and complain about that, Mister Gun Nut. At any rate, um, yeah, it was it was just fairly interesting to hear them discuss things this way. And then he, uh, I guess, I guess he abandoned the rifle in an effort to be able to climb down and walk out with the escaping crowd. And I guess it worked for a while. But somebody spotted him and spotted his uh, clothing and the car he got into, and he was. Uh, followed or chased down somewhere, spotted and then uh, stopped by police. By the way, you know, arrested more or less without incident. At the same time that, well, elsewhere in the country, Akron, Ohio, Jalen Walker uh, gunned down to to say that, I mean, that's almost not even a a reasonable uh, description of the term for what happened to him. Of course, black man being chased for I don't know what, probably traffic violation, and police video available pretty quickly, I must say. I don't know what, they must have thought they were right, which is amazing that they put the body camera footage out so quickly. But uh, yes, another marked contrast between the way they pursue uh, suspects who are black versus suspects who are white, And I think everybody probably took note of that, as I believe one of the lines, one of the orders shouted by police to the Highland Park murderer was, do me a favor and get down on your knees, which is a marked contrast to. But if you were listening, if you listened to the audio that went along with the Jalen Walker shooting, you would have heard. This is always very interesting to me as they always say, just comply with police commands. If you can make out from that audio what the hell any of the police commands actually were, uh, I don't know. Congratulations to you. You're you're a savant. It's unbelievable. I, I, I always wondered whether that would make any difference whatsoever. You'd have to live, of course, for it to make any difference. Or I guess have your estate. Your estate could be suing the police and whoever else over your murder, but. You know, the idea that you should just comply with police orders and everything would be fine. And like, play the audio and say, how do I comply with effort? You know, I can't even say the words. I I can, but then I'd have to bring out the censoring horn and it's really not appropriate for this situation. But I mean, the only things I can make out is that sounded like an obscenity and something, something, something. I didn't hear hands or don't move, or police, or anything like that, or there's nothing. It's all completely unintelligible, and then laced with profanity, and that's the only thing you can make out, is that that guy, well, let's see, I don't know what he was asking me to do, but I I did hear him call me an MFer, and that I shouldn't effing something, blah, 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 and put my effing da-da-da somewhere, I, I... I didn't understand anything he was saying, except that he was extraordinarily angry. And uh, I don't know. We don't discuss that very much. Anyway, uh, oh, there was another aspect of yesterday's events that I thought were somewhat interesting. I would have to scroll around to find it uh, in my feed, but I retweeted it. It was uh, locally prominent and, in fact, nationally prominent, I would say. Uh, Chicago... Sun Times reporter Lynn Sweet, who was at the parade. She is uh, not only a columnist and therefore well known, but uh, apparently the Washington bureau chief of the Chicago Sun Times. But she wasn't in Washington yesterday. Yesterday she was in the Chicago suburbs, like exurb of uh, of Highland Park. Actually, at the parade. I don't know. Maybe she lives there. Maybe she just finds it the most excellent parade in the area. Uh, But I guess probably there in a personal capacity. Anyway, she was there. She was tweeting her experiences and some of the photos that she took. I thought this was really interesting. And uh, I only saw one. And it it was interesting. She very likely, I think, made the decision to tweet this photo out 
with a journalist's mind. Uh, and I think, at least the one I saw, made sure to tweet out something, well, one with no personally identifiable information. There were no faces shown. There was a pool of blood on the sidewalk. No victim visible. They'd been removed or had run away or I don't know exactly what happened, but there's a pool of blood on the sidewalk. There are a few people walking by, but their heads are not in the shot. So you can't tell who they are. And um, like I said, selected probably with a journalist's eye. I need to convey the gravity of what's happened here. The blood will do it. And I don't want to get into the whole craziness of you're exploiting victims or you don't have their permission, or it's it's wrong to do this right now, or too soon, or whatever. So she sent just this picture of the blood. And yet, still, she got too soon in the comments. And somebody, who later reversed their position, thankfully, I should note that, somebody was saying, you know, this is just, I appreciate your experience as a journalist, but this is just not the time to show a picture like this. And I mean, I didn't get into much of an argument. I just was passing by, and I saw this thing, and I was just like, you know, it really is. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with showing that picture. And to this person's credit, they later did say, "Oh, you know, you're you're probably right. I I, I think I'm just shocked and 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 I don't know what to think. Uh, maybe this person was local to the area. Maybe not. But just observing it and saying, "All right, you know what? I I, I might not be thinking clearly. I'm just so clearly disturbed by what's going on here that I'm not." I'm not processing this correctly. So, I mean, it was nice that they sort of changed their mind about that. But I, I thought that was interesting that even really, I mean, it, she's on the spot reporting on something that happened to her personally as a journalist, though. And I don't know. I, I found it really interesting that there was uh, even pushback about that. Other things that I thought was really interesting. Uh, Peter Segal, apparently also in the neighborhood, and he had tweeted yesterday uh, that he actually went out for a run through the Highland Park parade route about 45 minutes before the shooting. And he was noting there were police with guns and body armor, as is now standard, everywhere, handling traffic, helping the setup. And then he notes at the end, good guys with guns every six feet. And yeah, no discernible impact on preventing mass shootings from happening. So that was another myth that died yesterday. The first myth being you can go out and have a good time on July 4th because it's safe in this country and the guns make us safer. And well, that was obviously out the window. But then no number of good guys with guns was, were able to protect anybody from a mass shooter. In fact, uh, hundreds of guys, good guys with guns, Deployed for just this purpose, by the way, why else would they be in body armor, uh, are not only unable to stop the shooting, unable to identify where the shooting is even coming from. And the shooter walked away from the whole thing. Now, th thankfully, somebody had an eye out and saw somebody suspicious or maybe saw somebody climbing down from a building. And, and there were plenty of people who were tweeting that were on the spot at the shooting who said, I could see the shooter on the rooftop. So uh, that's good. I mean, he was he didn't go completely undetected. And it's probably also a good thing, by the way, that even if the cops did see him on the rooftop, that they didn't just start firing at the rooftop. You can't really be shooting up from the ground and, and, and have any hope of doing very much. Not to mention the fact that your bullets go flying into the neighborhood on a very crowded and busy day. But so I don't know whether any cops thought of shooting and practiced restraint, unlike what happened in Akron, which is uh, bizarre on another note. I, I should go back to that one just to contrast not only the um, the differences in the apprehension of the suspects, but I might as well mention, I mean, you know, the most appalling part of the Walker shooting was that he was shot 60 times, which is. Rather unbelievable, to put it mildly. And uh, also that apparently 90 rounds were fired, which is incredible in its own right, because there wasn't very much time to do it, nor any reason to do it. But also the fact that, again, he was hit 60 times. 30 rounds fired off into the neighborhood somewhere. Nobody knows where exactly, but nobody really talking about that one. Uh, 
that's pretty amazing. Uh, not to mention the fact that they are firing 90 rounds at somebody who by the, you know, the second millisecond of the encounter is curled up in a ball on the, on the ground. I mean, the video is outrageous. There's just no explaining it. And just like there is no explaining it ever. And yet, you know, we'll see what uh, comes of it from the justice system. Anyway, I also understand from Peter Segal's uh, a later tweet, I guess we'll have to find this one, that he he says, you know, uh, do you know that he was fact-checked by one of the stupid newspaper fact-checker outfits that said they were trying to do the math and say, it really wasn't that there was a good guy with a gun every six feet. That's crazy. You're totally disproved, you know, partial. What, probably gave him a bunch of Pinocchios for that. And Seagal, of course, comes back and like, yes, it was, in fact, hyperbole. There weren't really armed guards every six feet. But the parade route, you know how it would be at a Fourth of July parade, especially in the age of terrorism and mass shootings. Yes, there were armed police everywhere. They were wearing body armor. They had all sorts of weaponry. And it made no discernible difference. And you should just admit that and don't be fact checking whether six feet was the actual interval but leave it to the fact checkers to do their things this way i don't know i found that rather bizarre uh there's more that i found rather bizarre and i uh, some of it i remember some of it i forget but we're taking a break i'm now preoccupied by that and uh yeah, okay. Well, there was something that uh, this reminded me of immediately. We'll see whether this two-minute break reminds me of what the hell it was that I was thinking of telling you about one or another of these mass shootings and the strange things that happened around it. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, yes. So I do, in fact, remember what I was going to talk. I was just uh, remembering that I did spend part of yesterday uh, thinking not only about that uh, mass shooting in Highland Park, but uh, comparing it because it had been video, well, I keep saying videotaped, even though there's no tape involved, but caught on video uh, by a number of people who were on the ground there in Highland Park. The first video I saw came from somebody who well, was being circulated on Twitter by somebody who claimed that it had been taken by their nephew. And I'm no reason to, to doubt that, except that people are weird and they do strange things and sometimes uh, are motivated oddly by the promise of Twitter fame, however fleeting, if they can make a claim that makes it look like they're more directly connected to the event than they really are when they just came across the video on their own, but I don't know, maybe this one was real and it would have been captured by this guy's nephew. But the claim was that it was, it was a kid with a phone who had captured the first video I saw, which I think involved the marching band uh, playing just fine, walking by and being videoed and then the gunfire breaking out and then the band members beginning to run. And, well, one of the interesting things was it's not entirely clear that everyone in the crowd understands what's going on initially. I think somebody who's sitting there watching the band play and then begin to run is applauding, clapping. It's a kid, like a teenager, who I guess thinks it's funny and weird that the band is beginning to run. 
And that's odd. But who knows what he was thinking or what he was able to discern from what he was hearing. But the rest of the people there begin very, you well, know, really actually very slowly to realize that this is gunfire and that they need to get the hell out of there. And then the rest of the video is the camera still on and somebody running and pumping their arms while they're running. But then you can hear a kid's voice, you know, saying, is that, is that a gun? Is that gunshots? And it reminded me very much of the video that I had seen the day before, I think, unless it had been Friday, but a video circulating, uh, or maybe it was on Saturday as opposed to, uh, you know, this weekend screwed me up. Uh, with the uh, Monday off, you know, you forget which day these things happen. So this, the big shooting was Monday. And then it might have been Sunday. It might have been Saturday that there was video circulating from out of Georgia of a road rage shooting that uh, took place. Oh, I don't know. It was a, but they were on, on the road somewhere in Georgia. I don't know if they even know what the motivating factor was. And they found the guy who did it and everything. So there's all sorts of reports out there if you really want to catch up on that one. But this is just a video, again, being taken by a kid in the minivan, the family minivan with his family. I don't know where they're going. And they are a car behind the car of the victim of this road rage shooting and they it looks like they're stopped at a traffic light or something because you know they're not really moving and you know traffic traffic light i got no idea at any rate the pickup truck red pickup truck to the right of this victim's car and one car length ahead and to the right of where the video is being taken just i don't know i'm not certain what provoked it but he begins shooting to the driver's left at the car to his left, which then just, uh, it's good thinking, he just turns the car around, and I don't know whether he drives through or over a median or something, I'm not certain what the setting is, but he just turns, does a U-turn to the left and takes off. He's he's shot, and apparently he drives himself to the hospital, and he's going to be okay, thankfully. You know, like... I remember we were talking about this the other day, going to be okay. Expected to make a full recovery without an arm or something. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure he'll recover from his injuries to some extent, but being shot, pretty traumatic. It looks like it was probably he was shot with a handgun, so he may not be torn apart quite as badly as it would have been with an AR-15, and I guess he's in luck in that sense. Uh, By the way, I noticed that the driver doesn't even bother to roll his window down, his own window, you know, and then like menace the guy with a gun and see if that makes any difference. He just shoots, but he shoots straight through his own window. He blows out his own window. To, I mean, he's just so anxious to use the gun. He's not anxious to avoid damage to his vehicle or anything like that. That's okay. Now he's taking his revenge. I'll deal with a broken window. That's just a couple hundred bucks. Imagine the value of the satisfaction I'm going to get of being, well, arrested for attempted murder and going to jail. Oh, well, I guess at that point, the window is the least of my problems, so let's go for it. That I don't know if that's the logic, but anyway, what struck me was that two days in a row, or nearly two days in a row, children had spent their time happily videotaping some event in their lives, and it was interrupted by a shooting. In the case of the Georgia... Uh, uh, road rage shooting the kids are screaming as the video is going on oh my god is that a gunshot is that is that gunfire they can't believe you know that they're personally caught up in something like this of course it did happen in georgia i don't know if they're georgians but do remember that we used to call the place guns everywhere georgia and who could have anticipated that in guns everywhere georgia and you recall that's because the uh, governors of georgia have continuously been signing laws liberalizing the availability and usability, for that matter, of guns everywhere in Georgia. Where can you carry them? I think the guns everywhere Georgia thing came from the fact that they said, yes, you can carry them to, in, with you in bars. Yes, you can carry them with you in churches. You can take them wherever you want. And police can't, they're not allowed to ask if you have a weapon, not allowed to ask if you have a permit for any weapon that they happen to see. Uh, it's just do what you want with the guns. And then this happens and 
golly gee, what a surprise. But the kids, the shock in the kids' voices was what was similar between the two videos and reminded me of what was going on here. And I don't know, I've got something in mind that I think everybody should pick up on. Maybe you have a better terminology for it. But I started reminding everybody it was complaining or lamenting the sad reality of the number of shots being fired, the fact that it's la raining lead everywhere in the United States, and saying, yeah, welcome to life as the Republicans want it. Uh, as I said, huzzah for the Republican Party and its platform of everyday terrorism. There should be terrorism in everyone's life every day, wherever you go. Baseball game, school, church, shopping mall, 4th of July parade, Terrorism for everyone. That is apparently the Republican platform, and they seem not at all interested in shying away from it either. Oh, they'll tell you it's about the doors, or, you know, tomorrow it'll be the, too many ladders near too many buildings. You can't have buildings with ladders, doors, or roofs. That's all of that is out now. We've got to deconstruct uh, shelter itself in order to make room for, well, we really all have to have handheld instant death machines. And the consequences of that are no more buildings, no more schools, no more public institutions or public interaction of any kind. Everybody has to live in a cave and shoot at everything that moves. And that's exactly how we want society to be. It's a little weird. It's not how I would have designed it. But, you know, I'm not a Republican. I can't think like them. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, there's probably more. I have things to catch up on in Twitter, some of which are not even remotely related to the shootings that were going on over the weekend, but probably some that are, too. And I have to catch up on them. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. The one in Philadelphia. I mentioned that there's something weird and wrong about it. And it's not the fact that there was, you know, another shooting or something that sounded like a shooting and got everybody worried that it might be a shooting at a big public 4th of July event, but it's something else. The circumstances of the shooting are, I mean, I haven't seen much reporting on it. I've just seen commentary on it. But, uh, you know, big crowd, of course, 4th of July, Philadelphia, shots ring out, maybe. No one's entirely sure about that. And... Two police, two policemen are hit, uh, sort of, in a way. Apparently, they're both very lightly injured. I guess one was hit in the shoulder, and I mean, if you're shot in the shoulder, that's not really a light injury. I, I, but, you know, it's not a life-threatening injury, but, you know, that could be it for his career, for one thing, depending on how badly injured he is. The other, it, uh, other officer was described as having been grazed in the head, by a bullet. And then this weird miracle of, hey, they found the bullet that grazed his head and it's tucked up in his cap. And there's even a picture of it on the local ABC News affiliates coverage of it. And I mean, as people pointed out, the bullet is pretty much pristine. There's this like unscathed bullet just sitting in the lining of his cap. And remember, he's grazed in the head, so it's, uh, you might say, well, in the head, and so uh, the bullet comes to rest in his cap. That makes a certain amount of sense. But yeah, the, the, the pristine condition of the bullet makes you think that, I don't know, like, did this shooting happen for sure? Uh, one of the better explanations given for it was that maybe it was even just the result of celebratory gunfire from somewhere. That sometimes happens because the the bullet, you know, slow down considerably, fired up into the air, and then they fall back down. Uh, they can come down at, you know, significant velocity, of course. Gravity is pulling down on them, but it's, it's less than being fired out of a gun directly. Uh, sometimes just the height that they're falling from is enough, and they'll, it'll bust through your roof. It, if it hits you, you can absolutely be killed. People are killed all the time uh, by uh, celebratory gunfire. But also sometimes these bullets sort of come to rest and are found and they're in pretty good condition when they're found. So it's possible that that's the case, although I don't know how close he was to the other officer who was shot in the shoulder. But if the gunfire was coming from 
relatively far away such that the bullets are, you know, coming to rest in your hat unscathed, it's less likely that two police officers, you know, at random would have been the ones that were hit and nobody else was. I don't know, but this there's still a lot like unexplained about this one. And I saw people commenting on that, which I, I think was kind of odd to say the least. Uh, our friend uh, NYC Southpaw was the first that I saw commenting on it, but I think he was one of many people commenting on it saying the public facts out of Philadelphia are a little weird and to my eye pretty characteristic of reporters uncritically repeating what cops tell them. One cop winged, another grazed, a pristine bullet found tucked in his cap, and no other reported injuries. What? It does seem kind of strange, doesn't it? Uh, And uh, there's a police handout with a photo that uh, appears in the Philadelphia Inquirer story. They they, kind of went straight to print with the story they got told by the police, which is a bit unusual, to say the least. Uh, there was another similar comment, many similar comments made. Uh, but here, I grabbed the local ABC News affiliate reporter's tweet here from the FOP president, the Fraternal Order of Police, the union, John McNesby, uh, Sharifa Jackson with Channel 6, ABC News there, I guess, in Philly, uh, Reporting, he just left the hospital after spending time with the injured officers. He says they're both okay and alert. He says angels were with the officer grazed in the head. The bullet hit his cap and he shared this pick. And here it is. And, you know, that is a pretty pristine looking bullet. It just seems quite odd. Quite odd. So anyway, uh, and then lots of people in the comments saying, Interesting things like ask McNesby why he supports the Pennsylvania State House candidacy of a Bucks County person who is known to have had leadership in a three percenters militia. And ask them again about how proud boys like Zach Rail uh, were welcomed into his Philly Lodge Five as drinking buddies. Well, those are all good questions. And... um Interestingly, also somebody else pointing out here, I don't know uh, what police were claiming was happening in terms of who was shooting what, but apparently, well, this guy here says that's not a 223 round that they said he was firing. The, the 223 is the uh, more common uh, round fired out of an AR 15, which probably wouldn't lodge pristinely in your cap for one thing. And as other people noted here, it looks more like uh, maybe a 38 caliber or maybe a nine millimeter bullet, but um, not a 223 round. And that's a, that gets a hmm emoji. I don't know. It just seems like a lot of weirdness and well, a lot of uh, maybe appropriate pushback on this thing too. I wonder how that one will play itself out. Uh, let's see. All right, let's see. We should probably jump on to other subjects at some point, even though people are calling me on the phone in the middle of the show. I really have to put out the general word that I just can't answer the phone for the most part during these shows. Anyway, let's see. Uh, what other, um, things do we need to add to the roundup of today? Let's see. I got to click on some of these because they're just, um, Twitter notes and in pocket that doesn't tell you anything about it. it just tells you whose tweet it was and uh, sometimes you can't guess what was going on just from that oh yes all right there's more other things to catch up on let me start with this one here why not uh this was of some interest over the weekend you might have expected that this was going to happen and in fact it did an ap story running in the huff post uh, Sarah Rankin is the writer here. And uh, the headline, Supreme Court, you remember them? Supreme Court asks state officials to stop protests outside justices' homes. Isn't this interesting? Uh, remember, of course, you're not allowed to protest outside of a 
a, a uh, Supreme Court justice's home because reasons, unless of course you want to. Um, I, I guess if you if you want to protest at somebody outside of somebody's home, you're going to have to do it outside of an election official's home because that apparently seems to be okay. But uh, they don't want to hear from people who disagree with their ruling, and you should listen to them because these robes that they have are very majestic looking, and that apparently is the only reason. But they want to use, interestingly, state officials to take care of this, even though the federal government rushed to their assistance, but it's interesting that they're turning to states. A U.S. Supreme Court marshal suggested, and this is actually a Supreme Court marshal, how do you like that, suggesting that laws in two states Prohibit picketing outside of the homes of justices. Let's see what they mean. This is datelined Richmond, Virginia. The marshal of the U.S. Supreme Court. Why in Richmond? I don't know. Has asked Maryland and Virginia officials. Ah, he's gone to the state government. I see. To enforce laws that she says prohibit picketing outside the homes of justices who live in the two states. For weeks on end, large groups of protesters chanting slogans, using bullhorns, and banging drums have picketed justices' homes. Marshal Gail Curley wrote in the Friday letters to Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, and to local elected officials. Curley wrote that Virginia and Maryland laws and a Montgomery County, Maryland ordinance prohibit picketing at justices' homes, and she asked the officials to direct police to enforce those provisions. Justices' homes have been the target of abortion rights protests since May, when a leaked draft opinion suggested that the court was poised to overturn the landmark 1973 Roe v. Wade case that legalized abortion nationwide. The protests and threatening activities have increased since May, Curley wrote in a letter, and have continued since the court's ruling overturning Roe v. Wade was issued last week. Earlier this week, for example, 75 protesters loudly picketed at one justice's home in Montgomery County for 20 to 30 minutes in the evening, then proceeded to picket another justice's home for 30 minutes, where the crowd grew to 100, and finally returned to the first justice's home to picket for another 20 minutes, Curley wrote in her letter to Montgomery County Executive Mark Ehrlich, which I think is just Ehrlich. Uh, at any rate, but it ends in the CH. This is exactly the kind of conduct that the Maryland and Montgomery County laws prohibit. But, of course, it's also exactly the kind of conduct that very often these same Supreme Court justices say you can't make laws to prohibit. Unless, of course, it uh, would inconvenience me to invalidate such a law, in which case I will uphold it because they're gimmitarians at heart. In her letter to Jeffrey McKay, chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, she said one recent protest outside an unspecified justice's home involved dozens of people chanting, no privacy for us, no peace for you. Yeah, so. The letters from Curley were dated Friday and shared with reporters by a spokesperson for the Supreme Court on Saturday. Curley's request came about a month after a California man was found with a gun, knife, and pepper spray near the Maryland home of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh after telling police he planned to kill the justice. The man, Nicholas John Roski, 26, of Simi Valley, California, has been charged with attempting to murder a justice of the United States and has pleaded not guilty. It's an odd mix of turning yourself in and pleading not guilty. Youngkin and Hogan, both Republicans, have both previously expressed concerns about the protests. In May, they sent a joint letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland asking for federal law enforcement resources to keep the justices safe and enforce a federal law that they said prohibits picketing with the intent to influence a judge. How interesting is that, by the way? The federal officials are writing letters to the state officials saying, you state officials have to use your laws to do something about this terrible situation. The state officials are writing letters to federal officials saying, you federal officials have got to use federal laws to do something about this situation. I mean, that's odd, don't you think? That's kind of strange. Well, at any rate... The direct request by the courts puts it at odds with the Justice Department, which, while providing U.S. Marshals, has not taken steps to limit the protests as long as they are peaceful. Yes, Hogan spokesman Michael Ritchie said in a statement Saturday that the governor had directed state police to further review enforcement options that respect the First Amendment and the Constitution. Wow. 
He also said that he that uh, had the marshal taken time to explore the matter, she would have learned that the constitutionality of the Maryland statute she cited has been questioned by the state attorney general's office. Hmm. Well, how would somebody working at the Supreme Court know whether the constitutionality of a statute has been questioned? I mean, come on. Okay, granted, it's the marshal. They're not really supposed to be. They're supposed to keep their eye on the safety of the court and its members. The court and its members are supposed to keep an eye on the constitutionality of these laws. But if they talk at all, maybe over lunch. Anyway, in Montgomery County, we are following the law that provides security and respects the First Amendment rights of protesters. That is what we do, regardless of the subject of the protests, he said. Youngkin spokesman uh, Christian Martinez said the Virginia governor welcomed the marshal's request and said Youngkin had made the same request of McKay in recent weeks. The governor remains in regular contact with the justices themselves, interestingly enough, and holds their safety as an utmost priority. He is in contact with state and local officials on the marshal's request for assistance and will continue to engage on the issue of the justices' safety, Martinez said. Youngkin in May pushed for a security perimeter around the homes of justices living in Fairfax County, but McKay rebuffed that request, saying it would infringe on First Amendment protest rights. McKay said Saturday that the county's position on the issues was unchanged. The law cited in the letter is a likely violation of the First Amendment, and a previous court case refused to enforce it. As long as individuals are assembling in public property and not blocking access to private residences, they are permitted to be there, he said. How quaint that he's following court precedent to decide this case, because the people being protested, well, their problem is they hate to follow court precedent. So you can see why there's a conflict here. It's it's a little odd. Let's put it that way. So I thought that was of some interest. Did I put away the other story that this reminded me of? Um, I don't I don't know. I it's hard to tell because there are five hundred thousand things that I put away over the weekend and it's not clear what all of them are but um yeah i mean i think i did put this one away somewhere but as i recall it had a weird headline and it might not be the one i'm thinking of so i gotta look around but there was ah yeah 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 i did find it um uh, the tweet that brought it to my attention is that of is this the one that leads to this one. No, it's actually a different one. Okay. Well, at any rate, uh, I do have the article that I was thinking of, which it was in NPR. And I saw it being tweeted around somebody recommending the article uh, about, well, uh, one of our usual subjects. Election deniers have taken their fraud theories on tour to nearly every state. Uh, this a piece at NPR, uh, the write-up here credited to Miles Parks, Allison Molenkamp and Nick McMillan and a very interesting story all in its own right but um, relating it to the previous story uh, I'll see if I can make this connection for you although where in the story this connection appears yeah it's not that far down so I can just start reading you the story and it begins this way again the headline election deniers have taken their fraud theories on tour to nearly every state just sort of an interesting story mapping out how widely disseminated these stupid stories are getting by how many election denial influencers out there. On a quiet Tuesday night in Howard County, Maryland, we're back in Maryland, dozens of people gather in a community center and listen to Seth Keschel's 10-point plan. Keschel and his photo illustrate this piece just above with a um, caption of his, uh, this, this picture having been taken during one of his stops in Manchester, New Hampshire in November of 2021, selling his stupid theory. So here they are, gathered to listen to his 10-point plan. Captain K, as he's known in election fraud circles, Cashel, right, what, um, is a former U.S. Army intelligence officer, unfortunately, and he is walking through his go-to presentation. Comparisons of vote totals from the past few election cycles, 
which he falsely claims prove President Biden's win in 2020 was illegitimate. Well, his 10-point plan to true election integrity, as he calls it, includes banning all early voting and requiring all American voters to re-register. In other words, he says, I want to clear the decks, invalidate all current registrations, start with a clean deck, everybody re-register. Don't worry about it. You know, If you're a legal, law-abiding citizen, it's no big deal. I just thought that was interesting all by itself because, of course, if you ask Keschel, I'm sure, about, well, we'd like to make it so that people have to say register their guns or something like that. Well, why are you punishing law-abiding citizens by making them register or even register again? And you're going to use this registry to hunt us down anyway. This is a violation of our privacy. All right. Well, fine. We'll forget that. Let's talk about your 10-point plan for election integrity. Right. Okay. My plan is... Everybody in America has to re-register. But well, why are you punishing law-abiding citizens? Oh, it's no punishment. Registration's not a big deal. You just uh, fill out the paperwork. But, but then when I said that about guns, yeah, but that's about guns. I'm talking about voting. You can absolutely do that about voting. God gave us the guns. Uh, voting is just a privilege. I mean, that's what's used to justify a stupid stance like that. But there it is. Uh, but that wasn't even what I came here to uh, talk about. I was talking about the fact that he, uh, he uh, like another similar influencer, speaking to audiences around the country, there is David Clements, who more than a thousand miles away the next night is speaking to an audience in Minneapolis about pretty much the same thing. And uh, professorial, as they as describe him, in his tan blazer with a graying beard and unruly curly hair. He begins his presentation with a prayer, and then he goes to his slideshow. Everybody's gasping occasionally at the stupid misinformation that he is presenting to them. And then he says, you got to take this to the offices and homes of your local officials. He says, they respond to fear. You need to hold these institutions with, not in, but with the contempt they deserve. You know, like the thing people are doing outside of justice's homes. All right, welcome back now to the Kago in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. So, yes, you get the point uh, as we were exiting. We probably could have used a few more seconds to wrap that point up. But then we'll continue with this story anyhow. So uh, we're going to get right back into it. But I just thought it was interesting that basically, you know, the gimmitarian situation that is developing along these lines are that, uh, oh, it should absolutely be illegal for liberal protesters to protest outside of the homes of Supreme Court justices, but at the same time, it should absolutely be legal and should be, in fact, encouraged by Republicans that conservative protesters ought to be protesting outside the homes and offices of elections officials. Now, granted, in this, uh, you know, in all fairness, to the extent that anybody is due any fairness, he does say that this should happen outside of their offices. And ostensibly, that's uh, a difference that probably uh, Republicans would point to and say, yeah, 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 you see, it's okay to protest at offices. Of course, unless you end up protesting at their office, <clears throat> in which case they want to enforce that or some other similar rule again. You can't be protesting here in my office. I, I have to go. Sometimes my children will come here and visit or my wife will meet me for lunch. And how dare you? Uh so, you know, as the situation warrants, they just ban protests around them and permit protests uh, around those they don't like quite as much. But I thought it was interesting. And, you know, like I say, they will probably point to and say, look, see, office versus something. Well, you know, the key phrase here really is they respond to fear. You need to hold these institutions with the contempt they deserve. I mean, it's bad syntax, but uh, I don't think that the fact that he's pointing out that they respond to fear and they need to be held in contempt and you need to treat them that way really bespeaks any sort of civilized restraint necessarily. Well, we're simply going to be having tea outside of his office. Well, how is that fear? How are they responding to fear in that sense? Well, the fear of getting reelected. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. But by the way, compare that to, for instance, just to bring things back to Jalen Walker, who we mentioned earlier, having been uh, gunned down in a literal hail of gunfire. Uh, and if you 
I, I, I hate to recommend that anybody view the video of that incident, but if you are the kind of person that isn't going to be terribly disturbed or traumatized by doing so, I, I recommend that you take a look at it just because that shooting is like some kind of farce of a Wild West show. How long they're firing and how much firing is going on is incredible. And when the day comes that they play that tape in court, it's really just going to damn all the officers who were on site there. Not that that necessarily means that they're going to be held responsible, liable, or in, in, in civilly or criminally guilty of anything. Because, hey, qualified immunity, et cetera, et cetera. And golly, I'm sure they were in fear for their lives. Because, as it was said by right-wing activists on social media, well... You know, Jalen Walker, he had a gun in his car. He had a gun in his car. Not unlike the guy over in Georgia who had a gun in his car and used it to shoot the guy in the car next to him, right in front of the kids in the minivan behind them. And yes, he was arrested, but, you know, he had a gun in the car. So that means you can shoot him 60 to 90 times. But they didn't. They arrested him. And who knows whether they gave him Burger King or not. And uh, golly, who knows why. They would treat these two people very differently. But at any rate, um, after the shooting in Akron, there was, I think, of course, right, you would expect that there would be some protest. Hey, this seems like an unusually violent uh, police shooting, totally unjustified, over the top, any number of complaints you might have about it, and legitimately so. The protest of which is met with, of course, tear gas, truncheons, riot gear, threats of mass arrests, all sorts of police violence. And by the way, uh, I noticed a very interesting photo uh, included in some of the stories about this, the Akron, they're, they're protesting outside of, I guess, Akron police headquarters. And the police have turned on uh, they've turned out all the lights or most of the lights in the building. It's nighttime. Everything's darkened, but quite obviously visible is a special lighting system that they appear to have had installed that portrays that that metaphorical, but now, now turns into a, a, a physical manifest, manifestation of the metaphorical thin blue line. The thin blue line that Waits 70 minutes to help kids in the middle of a school shooting. You remember that one. Anyway, uh, but they apparently spent some money <laughs> at some point in Akron to install a lighting system that could display that thin blue line at certain critical moments, like when they're being protested by the community from having, for having gunned this person down in a most outrageous fashion. So people came to speak up about that and they're, cracked over the head and tear gassed and sent away. Uh, I just watching them being gassed and beaten away from the office uh, where the cops were just reminded me of having just read the story about how the election deniers are telling everybody that uh, uh, officialdom responds to fear and that you need to go to the offices of your local officials and protest and and put them in fear of something. I don't know what, but I guess if that uh, officialdom includes the police department, you should expect to be gassed and beaten over the head. Except if you're protesting election integrity, at which point you should expect that the door should be thrown open to you and that you can bring a, um, a, a USB drive and download the voter database and examine it for yourself, right? Sure, why not? Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. And what a theory that they respond to fear. And of course, that means that it, they are supposed to respond to fear imposed on them by middle class white people in suburbia. But anywhere else or any other color, uh, if you even threaten anything that, that comes close to fear, uh, well, golly, if they fear for their lives, or the people who fear for their lives know people who are on the police force who are empowered by qualified immunity and everything else to fear for their lives and therefore shoot and kill everything around them, well, then it just works out differently. You know, whose fault is that? Gosh, I can't uh, be held responsible for all that. So anyway, back to NPR, which I think is telling a very interesting story here. There is Captain K here. What was his name? Uh, Seth 
Keschel, the former U.S. Army intelligence officer, giving his presentation, the strength of which is, hey, look at this. There were different numbers of people who voted in this year versus that year. So therefore, the whole thing is fraud or something like that. And then, of course, everybody in America has to re-register to vote because that's not an imposition, but gun registration is. The next night, as I was setting that story up, more than a thousand miles away in Minneapolis in a small building across from a popular garden shop, Roughly 60 people wait for the second of these activists, David Clements, to take the stage. Clements, the professorial guy, right, uh, begins his presentation with a prayer, goes to his slideshow. The audience, which appears to be all white and mostly middle-aged, occasionally gasps as he shows charts and graphs. Wow, (gasps) charts, graphs which he claims contain evidence of widespread election fraud. Clements ends his talk with a request to the people in the audience, go to the offices of your local officials. They respond to fear. You need to hold these institutions with the contempt they deserve. An NPR investigation found that since January 6th, 2021, the election denial movement has moved from Donald Trump's tweets to hundreds of community events like these in restaurants, car dealerships, and churches, led by a core group of election conspiracy influencers like Keschel and Clements. And there's a a graphic here. Uh, There are two other activists named in this piece and traced all over, and they have a map uh, with dots representing each of the events that they've done uh, since January 6, 2021, and it looks, to, they, I think they make the claim that it's in virtually every state. And uh, interestingly, one of the states where you'd think this would be super popular, Wyoming, I see no dots, which is interesting maybe because uh, I don't know whether it's just they say, what's the point? Or everybody there already believes it. Or that's where Liz Cheney is, so she'll fight us. I don't know. Not certain. Anyway, yeah, in some of these places that uh, where they say there have been such events, they're barely in that state, like right on the border of that state, like they were afraid to go into it. It looks like Arkansas doesn't have any either, which is kind of odd. Anyway, moving on, uh, there's lots of dots there. These local gatherings may reach fewer people than viral Internet posts. Hmm, maybe. Some of these viral internet posts don't really reach that many people. Anyway, but they seem to effectively spur action by regular people who are motivated by their almost evangelical intimacy. It's this constellation of election conspiracy theorists, said Chris Krebs, former, you might remember, you remember the name? Former Department of Homeland Security official in the Trump administration, who oversaw the federal government's election security efforts in 2020. You can see the complexion of local politics shifting as a result. They have decentralized post-January 6th and are really trying to affect change at the lowest possible level. NPR monitored the election denial influencers through events advertised on their public social media accounts, the websites and social media accounts of local organizations, events that NPR attended, video footage and news reports over the past 18 months. Four prominent purveyors of voting misinformation stood out, crisscrossing the country to appear at at least 308 events in 45 states and the District of Columbia. NPR tracked Keschel and Clements, as well as Douglas Frank, whose misleading claims to have discovered a secret algorithm that swings vote totals across the U.S., his methodology has been widely debunked by voting experts, and My Pillow CEO, Mike Lindell. The scale of their movements paints a portrait of an election denial movement that has evolved into a nationwide force beyond just swing states. And despite the January 6th committee's investigations and efforts by voting officials at every level to combat disinformation. NPR's investigation is the first such effort to document the scope of these influencers. It's an existential threat to American democracy, said Franita Tolson, an elections expert at the University of Southern California. If the numbers get big enough, it's unclear whether we will survive it. Hmm. This next section entitled The Chain Reaction begins with Carly Copes, Cops, K-O-P-P-E-S. Carly Copes, who runs, I'll say cops. Uh, who, like uh, like the TV show comes, who runs elections in Weld County, Colorado, says 
she noticed a tone shift in her county after Douglas Frank came to town. She's reading over an email that just came in from one of her voters. Traitors will be exposed. These guys are going down and you have no chance. She trails off as she scans. You deserve everything coming your direction. The Republican county clerk takes a long sigh. Last summer, a group of suspicious citizens here knocked on thousands of doors looking to uncover evidence of election fraud. It started because of Dr. Frank, I guess he's a doctor, and his really bad data analysis, cops said. Him and his people, unfortunately, just don't know how to read election records correctly. Hmm, well, it's going around. Uh, what did I see the other day? Oh, right, yeah, Nikki Haley, is that right? Uh, uh, tweeting around uh, the, the latest, I guess, uh, Republican propaganda about inflation and saying, oh, inflation is so bad, and if you're having your 4th of July cookout, look how much more it's costing you. And as I recall, it was a tweet with, like, totals, just misunderstanding percentages entirely, uh, that the cost of hot dogs was up 16%, and the cost of soda was up uh, 8%, you know, all those things, potato chips, charcoal, whatever, I guess, you would need for uh, for your, your 4th of July picnic. And then she just added up all the percentages percentage increases of all the various items assuming you buy them all but that doesn't even work it doesn't matter whether you buy them all or not because the mathematics isn't right right you can't add a 16 percent rise in the price of soda to a 10 percent rise in the price of hot dogs and say the overall price of your fourth of july cookout has gone up 26 percent that's not the way percentages work but that's the way her tweet worked so never mind what works and what doesn't anyway uh Innumeracy is rampant throughout America, but in particular, it seems, in the Republican corners of America. So anyway, where were we on NPR? Uh, the local election official in Weld County, Colorado, saying it started because of Dr. Frank and his really bad data analysis. He and his people, unfortunately, just don't know how to read elections records correctly. In his former life, Frank, Dr. Frank, was a high school math and science teacher in Ohio. So somebody who was supposed to know about this math and science thing. He's moved on to touring the country, spreading election fraud conspiracies full time. Why is he trying to indoctrinate our, our school children? Okay, our oldest school children. But hey, still. Anyway, he and three other men, the three other men whose movements NPR documented either did not respond to requests for comment or declined to comment for this story. In the visit cops mentioned on April 24th, 2021, Frank held court in a Doubletree Hotel conference room near Denver. Dozens of people cheered. I mean, these are small events, but dozens of people cheered as Frank pointed at graphs that he claimed showed how the 2020 election was marred by fraud something that's been debunked many times by hand counts, audits, and investigative reports across the country. Go knock on some doors, Frank implored. And many people in this Colorado community listened. A group popped up there dedicated to this sort of fraud-motivated canvassing, and they devoted their organizing playbook to Frank. Jim Gilchrist, a doctor of holistic medicine in Colorado, saw an online posting of Frank's talk and volunteered to canvas with the group. He estimates he spent more than 20 hours last summer knocking on doors. I just kind of wish there was some mechanism for there to be a more transparent way, uh, transparent kind of way, of making sure the vote was counted correctly. Whatever that's supposed to mean. Gilchrist said in an interview with NPR, Douglas Frank kind of offered a solution that we could do as citizens. A lot of kind of in all this. Anyway, influencing policymakers. That's the next section. The election denialists also frequently bump elbows with people in power. NPR found that over the past year and a half, the men met or appeared with at least 78 elected officials at the federal, state, and local levels, many of whom will have a role in how future elections are run and certified. At least two secretaries of state, two U.S. senators, 10 U.S. representatives, two state attorneys general, and two lieutenant governors met or appeared with the figures NPR tracked. And there are just four of them, right? More than three dozen members of state legislatures, many of whom have introduced legislation in their states that would affect how Americans cast ballots, have also appeared at events with them. 
Our voices have gotten bigger and bigger every single day since last year, and you cannot stop that, said Mike Lindell at a rally in January of 2022, attended by three members of Arizona's congressional delegation, Debbie Lesko, Andy Biggs, and Paul Gosar, all of whom voted not to certify Arizona's election results at the U.S. Capitol a year earlier. We will get your country back. By the way, Andy Biggs spent his 4th of July uh, outside of a, I don't know what, a U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service or Border Patrol facility where immigrants were lining up eh, quite orderly and peacefully outside of the building. But it was 4.30 a.m. and he videoed himself saying how menacing this whole thing was and look at the danger that awaits you. Uh, immigrants are lining up to be processed because of how illegal they are or something, something. And uh, it was a marked contrast with uh, what was going on, of course, later in the day in Highland Park. Oh, yeah, that's supposed to be scary. Here's Highland Park, Illinois. This will scare the pants off you versus the quiet line of people doing nothing over there in the background. Anyway, digression. Uh, let me see if I can write a note to look for that Andy Biggs tweet on immigration later on just to show it to you back to the npr story though um although this did remind me of something else i wanted to go chase down too uh now i can't recall what it was oh yes all right uh note to self here about uh various election legalisms that I wanted to bring up. All right, back to NPR. In some cases, the election denial influencers worked to persuade skeptical officials to embrace their claims. In May of 2021, Frank met with staff from the Ohio Secretary of State's office for more than two hours. NPR acquired audio of the meeting, which was first reported by the Washington Post, through a public records request. The staffers in the meeting pushed back on Frank's many fraud accusations, and at one point he responded by threatening to send unauthorized people, or plants, as he put it, into local voting offices. Like So, you know, you have a meeting with a guy, he makes his pitch, and you're like, you know what, I'm just not convinced. Oh, yeah? Well, we're going to conduct secret operations against you. Hmm, that seems, you know, balanced and fair. Excellent. Thank God we were... Here doing this. We have plants everywhere that go into buildings where your machines are on, when your machines are on, and capture your IP addresses. We have those. Not necessarily in Ohio. Remember where he's meeting with the Ohio State Secretary of State here. Not necessarily in Ohio, but we can arrange for that, Frank said, his voice rising. So all I'm trying to point to you, out to you, is that this is coming. Be ready. And I'm not trying to fight you. Do you see that I'm trying to help you? He sounds very helpful. We're going to break into your buildings and capture your IP addresses. I mean, I guess that's supposed to sound like technical and therefore beyond maybe my understanding. And so therefore scary. But I mean, you're going to get my IP address. I'm the I'm a I'm a, I'm a public uh, office. And you're going to get my IP address. I mean, you can get my IP address like. If you log on to like secretaryofstate.ohio.gov or whatever it is, I, I don't know what they're, you, know, you can get their IP address. You can convert that into an IP address. It's numbers. Yes. And then what are you going to do? But I, the, the thing is, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. We can get it. I don't have it, but we can get it. Just want you to know that we're going to send plants in. You know, you can do it from home. The thing is, getting an IP address doesn't mean anything. I think, you know, among these circles, you know, you say, well, if I have the IP address, that means I can access them by the Internet, right? Right. OK, I'll agree with that. And if I can access them from the Internet, then I can hack them, right? I see where you're going. But I mean, you're talking about you can hack the website of the Secretary of State. Yeah, I guess maybe you might be able to do that. And if I can hack the website and the the, the computer systems... Let me just blur the line there. Of the Secretary of State of Ohio, then, well, you can see what could happen. I can tamper with the vote. Don't you see it? I, I no. I mean, if you can get into the website, the public-facing website of the Secretary of State's office, that doesn't say anything about getting into the systems whereby they process registrations or count votes or anything of the sort. No, that doesn't follow. 
Oh, well, it's all on the computer. It's all on the interclouds. Uh-huh. Okay. Now I see where you're going. Uh, thank you for coming. Well, everybody can see this. I'm going to present this tomorrow at the Doubletree Hotel. Does everybody know? Can you see here the intercloud webs? You know all about that. Remember that time that you wanted to, you, you were saying, oh, I want to buy shoes, and you Googled up uh, shoes, and then the next day you got an ad about shoes? Huh? You know, okay. <gasps> that did happen to me. Therefore, the election is stolen. These double tree cookies are warm, just like they say in the end. This is unbelievable. So, therefore, you know, you become convinced somehow that this is going to work. So, that's the big threat. We're going to get your IP address. Well, no wonder that staffers in that meeting didn't budge. But shortly after that meeting, someone did attempt to breach an elections network in Lake County, Ohio, though a state official told NPR that no sensitive data was ultimately accessed. The four election denialists, and, and by the way, they'd point to that and say, see, you can get into the uh, Lake County, Ohio elections network. Yeah, I mean, no one said you couldn't. It's just that it doesn't follow from getting the IP address of the office where they host the, you know, where, that has a website. I mean, if you get the IP address of the actual network between the offices, that would be something if they if they store sensitive data on there, you'd be able to get that sensitive data. But apparently they either don't or you weren't. I don't know which, but it, no one can dispute that if you got access to critical computing assets, you would be able to do some damage or something. Although it's not necessarily the case that you would be able to change vote totals, which is your claim, but. It's also just not the case that getting the IP address, whatever that's supposed to be, at a building when their machines, whatever machines they may be, are on, which they don't need to be in order for you to get the IP address. Uh, whatever. I mean, what were you going to do with this information? I don't know. I have no idea where they were going. They're crazy people. How could anybody know? All right. Let's see. There's more, of course, to this story, except it's just that I got to remember which tab I'm looking at. Ah, yeah, okay. So where were we? Uh, remember, I'm not trying to fight you. Don't you see I'm trying to help you? The staffers don't budge. Somebody breaks into the, or attempts a breach of the elections network in Lake County, Ohio. No information is uh, accessed. The four election denialists also appeared with well over 100 candidates for local, state, and federal office in the 2022 primaries. Some, including U.S. Representative Mary Miller of Illinois and State Senator Doug Mastriano, who's running to be governor of Pennsylvania, have already won their party's nomination for the general election. Next up, a fraud evolution. The highest profile of the group that NPR tracked is the highest profile yeah, of the group is that of, I guess I should say, my pillow CEO Lindell a prominent and longtime Trump supporter. Lindell says he has spent millions of dollars on his crusade. I kind of hope that's true, actually. Which started almost as soon as ballots were cast on November 3rd, 2020. Sometime around March of 2021, he uh, brought Frank into the fold and Frank's popularity skyrocketed. I went from being completely mum to suddenly 10 million people knowing me in about a week, he told a group in Utah last July. Frank often speaks at events with Keschel and Clements. Clements is a lawyer and a former professor at the New Mexico State University Business School who was fired for not complying with the school's COVID policies, of course. Keschel is a retired Army captain and veteran of Afghanistan. While those in the group often repeat talking points and appear together, they don't necessarily coordinate appearances or strategy. And other than Lindell, they were mostly unknown before 2020. Now they're influencers in a movement with online followings of hundreds of thousands of people. They even promote merchandise like T-shirts, books, and body lotions, along with their election misinformation. Sure, why not? Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, a Democrat, says they're using election fraud as a vehicle to advance themselves. There's no shortage of ability to access the truth about our election system. Yet, there seems to be a proliferation of people willing to lie about it. It's, uh, I think it's logical to conclude that they know better. 
and that they're knowingly spreading misinformation to win elections, to raise money, to gain attention and celebrity. Benson says her office has been a, a direct correlation between, says they've seen a direct correlation between election denier events in Michigan and a rise in harassment toward voting officials. We've, of course, covered this ground before, but, you know, I just thought it was an interesting contrast to what they allow elsewhere. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, KGRO in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. Welcome back to the k in the Morning Show here on Networks Radio. All right, just finding you some more fun things to uh, use in our roundup and other things to catch up on. Uh, let's jump back into the NPR article because I just, you know, I think it uh, it's a great jumping off point for discussion of a number of things and a great underlying story as well. So where were we? Ah, uh, yes, right, um, that... Uh, the Secretary of State in Michigan, Jocelyn Benson, uh, was saying that there's a direct correlation between these election denier events and the rise in harassment towards voting officials. And how interesting it is that uh, the Republican line is, you know, run around the country and tell people to protest uh, outside the homes and offices of uh, officials that they don't like, but that they should invoke state and local laws to prevent uh, the protest outside of the homes and offices of officials that they do like, whether that's the Supreme Court justices banning abortion or police who like to shoot people uh, and fire their entire magazine into people who are already down on the ground and to do it 10 or 12 at a time. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. There is uh, more from Benson here who first notes that direct correlation in the appearance of election deniers and in the rise in the threats. Whenever there's an appearance in which the former president or Lindell or others come out attacking our system, we know to expect an uptick in threats and we add additional security as a result. Uh, that's because election denialism has grown from a political movement into something almost religious, said Cops, a Republican county clerk in Colorado, there's just so much that is incorrect that they just keep repeating and repeating and repeating, cops said. And then as soon as I have absolutely blocked off that path with actual correct information, they just move that goalpost and they just keep moving the goalposts and moving the goalposts. Between conversations with voters and research on all the separate false claims that have popped up over the past two years, she estimates she's spent thousands of hours dealing with the fallout of Donald Trump's misinformation campaign. At this point, she says she's had to stop engaging with voters who were unwilling to listen to her. Some of these people really, truly believe that they're doing the Lord's work, cops said. But I think at the end of the day, they're so they so desperately want to believe what they're being fed that they're using all means to justify what they're doing. Yeah, I mean that's the heart of the problem, and uh, pretty much describes exactly what's going on and the fact that there's no convincing any of them. And these are the people, of course, whom Greg would tell you, no, you're just going to have to outvote them. There's just no bringing them back. No. Uh, you can stop with the memes of, well, I'm supposed to compromise with this. I mean, I am guilty of doing the same thing every once in a while. Uh, and it's illustrative, but 
Yeah, uh, you can't deal with them. You'd have to outvote them. I guess the real problem is that uh, it seems like the share of the Republican Party, which you can't deal with and simply have to outvote, is increasing. Luckily, there's also the question of whether or not their raw numbers are increasing. And if they're not, then you are capable of outvoting them. But it's just difficult. And of course, there's the added danger of them saying, well, it doesn't matter if you outvote us because we're going to claim that your votes are invalid and our votes were undercounted. And if we're in a position to sign a document as dumb as it is and as uh, facially uh, uh, ir- ridiculous and improper as it is, we're going to do it anyway. And people are going to have to take us seriously, at least briefly in court, then that's an issue. And of course, if you get a crazy judge or somebody who doesn't understand what's going on or somebody who's just highly motivated to understand it the way he wants to versus the way the actual argument takes you, then, well, you're going to have to deal with it for a little longer. You're going to have to take it seriously in appellate court, too. And then, you know, once it gets to the appellate level, you know, uh, strange things begin to happen. Yes, all the logic says that it should have gone the other way. But the fact is that we're here at this stage of the process and therefore a different kind of analysis kicks in. And despite the fact that it was facially ridiculous to everybody, it's now here and we have to consider it in different light. And dumb rules get made up and theories are invented. And there you go. Speaking of theories that are being invented, uh, and here's where we could, uh, one of these days we're just going to have to have Armando come back and explain the intricacies of what he's been thinking of with respect to the, I guess, the case that's coming next time around. Moore versus I don't remember who. (laughs) But the Moore case, uh, which is the vehicle by which the weirdos in the Republican Party, and I include in that the justices of the Supreme Court, intend to take up consideration of the so-called independent state legislature theory, which isn't a thing, but got invented recently as a cover for their gimmitarianism. Um but, uh, you know, actually has some roots. I, you know, I keep saying it's made up. I, the version that John Eastman wanted to use to justify his crazy theory for why Mike Pence should be able to do what he wanted to do, or he didn't want to do it, but why Mike Pence should have been able to do what John Eastman wanted him to do is, I think, only loosely based on a thing which kind of sort of does exist, but doesn't really predate like Bush v. Gore. So not very old. You know, it's 20 years old now. Uh, the independent state legislature theory. and But the thing is, it's been invoked, to the extent it's been invoked at all, it's been invoked to justify whatever the hell Republicans wanted at that moment. It's a very gimmitarian-ish uh, kind of a doctrine. Sometimes when they need to stop vote counting in Florida, it means that federal courts can intervene and define for state courts and state governments what they are and aren't allowed to do with respect to their administration of federal elections. And sometimes it also means that no, state governments are in fact totally sovereign and we got to get out of the way and the federal courts have no role whatsoever in telling the states what to do. It just depends on what the situation is. If Republicans need to win this way, well, then this is what it tells states they have to do. If Republicans need to win that way, well, then this is what it tells states they need to do. And it's been garbage from the start. But let's see. Recently, um, uh, I meant to get to this last week, and it just didn't make it. Um Let's see that I have two articles and and there are many about this case. But the one that I was worried about or disagreed with um, most obviously for me was in just security, which is usually pretty solid on these things. Helen White wrote this piece for just security. And I don't think I'm familiar with Helen's name. So let's see. Uh, We'll go and take a look at the about the author. Helen White, who's on Twitter out there, H-E-B White, is a counsel at Protect Democracy. So, you know, I mean, it's not it's not a Republican trying to uh, uh, 
you know, tamp down fears about this thing. She's just trying to be realistic. Helen White is counsel at Protect Democracy on the Elections and Voting Rights team, where she leads Protect Democracy's work on the independent state legislature theory. So, you know, but this is an important person and maybe somebody who I wish I wouldn't have any disagreements with. But uh, I, I had my doubts. Let's see. And, and uh, I'm trying to remember where I might even find my own tweets about this uh, theory. And uh, uh, I can't remember whether um, I can't remember any of the words that I was using in disagree. Well, let me read you the article and maybe that will spark my memory about this. But the independent state legislature theory, the headline says, should horrify the Supreme Court's originalists. Well, sure. OK, great. The Supreme Court grants cert in Moore v. Harper, there's the other name, taking on the question of state legislature's power over federal elections. And I tell you, we ought to have Armando on. Armando has done a tremendous amount of thinking about this as well and you know, has actually read the, you know, the opinions below in Moore v. Harper and has read other cases which he, you know, very closely, which he believes bear on how the court and if there were an ordinary court and actually followed logic and precedent ought to approach this because he's fairly convinced. And, you know, I mean, he's right. He's got reason to believe it, that some of what they uh, the, the current Republican court seems bound and determined to find in Moore has and to allow in Moore has, in fact, been explicitly addressed and prohibited by in, in previous Supreme Court precedent, the problem, of course, and Armando will happily remind you of it, is that they don't care about precedent anymore. If it gets in their way, they're happy to just mow it down. But everyone should understand logically what's happening. Anyway, first, let me read Helen White's uh, description of things this morning. And this was back on June 30th. The Supreme Court decided to hear Moore v. Harper, a challenge to the congressional maps in North Carolina, that has the potential to upend over 200 years of election law. Now, how do you get from the maps to the idea that people can send um, slates of electors back to states for re-voting and have the independent state legislatures just decide, you know, um, we don't care about the outcome of the election and we don't care about safe harbor and we don't care about time as a concept. We can just redo the election in our own image and we don't have to listen to the people and we can do it at any time. You can get as many bites at the apple in determining the method of choosing your state's electors as you want. Totally unbound by time. But how does that come out of a challenge to congressional maps in North Carolina? Well, let's find out. In Moore, members of the state legislature are urging the Supreme Court to reinstate the map that they drew and that North Carolina courts struck down as unconstitutional and redrew using what is known as the independent state legislature theory. They, and as they now abbreviate independent state legislature as ISL. It'll save us all some time. Okay, so uh, what's going on here? And remember, by the way, North Carolina is the place, since we're speaking of the North Carolina Supreme Court and the election uh, the, or the... Um, the election boundaries, and the maps that they drew. You'll recall that uh, North Carolina was the place where the judges got a hold of some extraordinary evidence from the people who drew the maps, right? The uh, elections consultants with the Republicans behind the maps who left behind extraordinary notes and emails saying, uh, basically, I can't wait to do this because of how discriminatory it is against black voters in this state. Let's go get rid of them all. I mean, you know, I don't remember what the wording was, but there were, I do recall that the court was explicit in saying um, he's, they've made it as clear as possible that this is like going to be facially discriminatory. And what did they say? This was the one where they said with almost surgical precision, they cut up uh, black voting communities in ways that were designed to disempower them. And it was 100 percent obvious to the state Supreme Court. And now the federal Supreme Court is in the position of saying we need to tell North Carolina 
that they don't understand. The North Carolina Supreme Court just doesn't understand the North Carolina Constitution the way we do. We see the true interpretation of the North Carolina state constitution and the state Supreme Court of North Carolina doesn't just they just don't get it. We're going to have to correct them. That's their theory. So where are we here? The ISL theory is going to be their leverage here. That theory claims that the federal constitution gives state legislatures the power to regulate federal elections without checks from other state officials or constraints from the state's constitution. That's the that's the difference here. They think that the state legislatures only, it's not that the state governments get to say how elections will be run, but that state legislatures, a singular and, and, and individual part, one branch only of the state government gets to decide these things with no checks and balances, which is, of course, just what the founders intended. No checks and balances. Everyone remembers that from high school civics, right? Unless, of course, you remember actual high school civics in which the lesson was exactly the opposite, that there were, in fact, checks and balances. But let's pretend that there aren't and were never supposed to be. That's the theory. Isn't that a great theory? Let's give it real credence in the courts. Again, the theory is that the federal constitution gives state legislatures the power to regulate federal elections without checks from other state officials or constraints of the state's constitution. Though more concerns congressional redistricting, the ISL theory reaches far further and would have sweeping and dangerous implications for most aspects of federal elections. Yes, in 2020, Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, oh, I'm sorry, there's more, and Neil Gorsuch, and at times Brett Kavanaugh, all indicated that they would have adopted the theory and its vast consequences on the emergency docket, the old shadow docket. Remember that? These justices are all part of the court's originalist faction, quote-unquote originalist faction. Originalists like these four justices and Justice Amy Coney Barrett contend that constitutional provisions mean what they meant to the public that adopted them not you now who consent to them, you see. As Justice Barrett has, Barrett has explained, originalists, quote, care about what people understood words to mean at the time that the law was enacted because those people had the authority to make law. Or at least we all have the authority to make law. They capitalized on the authority to make law and then made it. Okay, since 2020, however, New historical research has emerged that puts the ISL theory at odds with the original public meaning of the Constitution. Whoops. Though all eyes will be on Justice Barrett, who has not yet opined on the theory, Moore also offers the rare opportunity for Justices Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh to show the principled nature of their commitment to originalism by updating their views in light of new founding era historical analysis. Oh dear, what's this? Well, first up, our next uh, section here, defining the independent state legislature theory. Oh, why don't we do that? That would be nice. The ISL theory is really multiple overlapping theories that fall within the broad name. Ah, so you can't really say for sure what it is and what it isn't. The crux of any version of the theory is that the federal constitution's mention of state legislatures in the elections and electors clauses should be understood as a giant, I'm sorry, giant, it's grant, as a, as a giant pile of, okay, as a grant of sole authority to state legislatures in setting the rules for congressional and presidential elections, respectively. Remember, this uh, was something I began to address when the uh, federal case, uh, the, the court in, the case in federal court in Wisconsin came up post-election, uh, claiming that the federal constitution's grant right to state legislatures to determine the method of the election of their electors right and that trump's people were saying what that means is uh if you want to change the size of the slot on a drop box 
the state legislature has to do that. It's non-delegable. They can't say that local boards of elections can design their own drop boxes. I mean, this is the, the, the way it could be applied. They were applying it to other things, like the fact that there are drop boxes at all, or that during the pandemic, for reasons uh, that were obvious then in particular, uh, about people gathering and people having interactions. We were all supposed to be sort of distancing from each other and everything was contactless delivery, et cetera. Right at the height of that, uh, they added special provisions that would make it more plausible for people who were voting by mail or absentee ballot to be able to get their ballots delivered with the minimum amount of contact, right? And so in some cases, in some states, and some local election boards even sometimes divided down to the county level. They made different decisions in some states where that's supposedly allowed by statute. Uh, they said, uh, well, you know, for instance, certain regulations that ordinarily would prohibit one person from carrying the ballot of another to a ballot collection box, we will suspend some of this so that the, a fewer, a smaller number of people have to take the risk of exposing themselves to infection by coronavirus during the height of the pandemic by carrying these things through public and to a public gathering place and dropping them in there. Ordinarily, we would crack down on that or we'd prohibit that or we'd, or we'd strongly encourage people to bring their own ballots in. And the Republican theory was that since those regulations were relaxed without action from the state legislature, even though in many cases they actually did take action and approved of such loosening of registration of regulations, but then lost the election and changed their minds later on that remember it's uh, well, the federal constitution doesn't mention local elections boards or county election boards or county election judges or anyone but state legislatures. So any change at all in the way the election is conducted has to be, under their theory, enacted by the state legislature, as opposed to the state legislature saying, we hereby empower county boards of election or the state board of elections to make these decisions. This is very much, I think, very much related to the EPA case that they just handed down which uh, which addressed obliquely non-delegability. They're basically saying, no, the legislatures have to do everything. There can't be an administrative responsibility here because the Constitution says state legislatures. But, you know, by my logic, and, and I, I mean, I guess you're free to not accept it, but it's sort of been the basis of how we've done anything in this country for the past however many years we've been a country, that the, if you give the responsibility to the state legislature, then it belongs to the state legislature, not like it's not inseverable from the state legislature. The power rests with them and they can do whatever they want with it. They can make their own regulations or they can ask someone else to make those regulations. Uh, supposed originalists in this particular situation get what they want out of saying, no, 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 it's non-delegable. No, it doesn't say it's non-delegable. It says it, the power devolves to them. They can do what they want with it. It's absolute, right? You said it was absolute, and that has to include delegability. No, it doesn't, say the originalists, and so therefore, you know, they, they sound very huffy about it, so they must be right. That's basically what's going on here. Uh, although she kind of glosses over this because, you know, that should that'd probably be understood by the just security reading crowd. But, you know, we don't always read it. So let's explain. So where were we? The ISL theory, multiple overlapping theories that all stem from this one thing. And if there's one thing that is common to them all, it's the idea that granting power to a state legislature means something. The only question is what? In some versions... This idea means that a state legislature's regulation of federal elections could not be struck down by a state court on state constitutional grounds. That's the scenario in Moore. The Moore petitioners go further and claim that under this theory, a state legislature may not even delegate right, power to other state actors like courts or election officials to implement state election law where the legislature fails to address an issue. So again, just to clear this up, under the more mild version, I suppose, of ISL, 
the idea, and, and this is, I mean, it's not mild, it's terrible and stupid. The idea is that, well, the Constitution says state legislatures will do this stuff. And so that means that if a state legislature decides what this means is that the only votes you can count from now on are those cast for the Nazi party, not the metaphorical Nazi party, but the actual Nazi party. Let's just say they do that. Well, gosh, but we have no Nazi party by that name in this country. Well, it doesn't matter. The state legislature says the only votes that can be counted are ones cast for candidates uh, for or the electors working on behalf of candidates running under the Nazi party flag. Let's just say they did that, right? And then the state Supreme Court would al almost assuredly step in and say, now that's crazy. You can't just say from the state legislature that only one party's votes can be counted, even if it's not the Nazi party. You can't do that. The independent state legislature theory as presented here and as the petitioners in Moore presented says, yes, you can. And in fact, not only can you, but the state Supreme Court is prohibited by the federal constitution from saying that's crazy and unconstitutional under the state constitution. They don't even have to. It's not just that you're prohibited from saying something's unconstitutional. You're prohibited from taking the case. You cannot consider whether or not somebody's claim that it's crazy for the state legislature to only count the votes for one party ought to be dis even discussed by the Supreme Court. Why? Because the federal constitution says, in their view, legislatures, state legislatures get to make the rules. It doesn't say anything in the state or in the federal constitution that they get to have this power unreviewable by any other branch of government. And they could have said that if they wanted to, but they didn't want to, because remember that all of this hinges on the idea that for some reason the founding, we'll say fathers, because it mostly was, right? That the founders didn't want there to be checks and balances in our system. Except, of course, for all the civics lessons that said, oh, that was actually the heart of what they were doing. And the genius of the design of the Constitution is that everything has a check and balance at some level. Even the unreviewable Supreme Court has a check at some level. The members of the court can be impeached. Uh, the members of the court don't get to be members of the court without the uh, um, consent of the other two branches, or at least part of one of the branches, right? The government, the president for the entirety of the executive branch and the Senate on behalf of the legislative branch. Although really they should say, well, the legislature as a whole should act, but the constitution very clearly says the Senate will do it. Okay, fine. Otherwise I'd say, hey, bicameralism insists on a role for the House, but it really doesn't. But here they say state legislatures will make the rules and then they don't say that it should be unreviewable by, unreviewable by any other branch of government. But they are claiming that's implied by the fact that they say the legislatures will set the rules. Now, I would say that as an originalist, the reason that they say legislatures will determine the rules of the elections is because legislatures were understood to be rulemaking bodies at the time. You guys are the ones that make the laws, right? So yes. Okay, fine. Now, granted that judicial review had to be an invention and they might you might even be able to say that originalism doesn't even contemplate judicial review that is that's an argument you could make but we are kind of beyond that and of course for the supreme court to say there's no such thing as judicial review well that wipes out an awful lot more than they really wanted to in this gimmitarian situation but here we are and their claim is that the state courts can't even consider the question because they're not named in the Constitution as having any responsibility. But they go even further, and as they say, the, the uh, their view of it is because it's uh, a power that's granted to the state legislatures, and it doesn't say that it's delegable, but it doesn't say it's not, it therefore isn't because they don't want it to be in this situation. Other things is, are delegable if they need them to be, like if you want to delegate the power to uh, decide not to prosecute people under the Ku Klux Klan laws, they will be perfectly happy with that. But you see how weird and sweeping this is? 
and it doesn't even get to the fact that there's a yet another version out there and I haven't even gotten a quarter of the way through this article but I'm just incensed by this article uh, we'll discuss this more in the coming days certainly if Armando joins us at any point but it doesn't even get to the fact that John Eastman's theory on all this is also if the state legislature decides that they're going to have an election they can change their minds even after they've held the election and just say, well, it didn't come out the way we wanted to. Uh, oh, yeah, because fraud or something like that. And just wave some papers around and point to some numbers like they do with the election denier influencers who tour the country and then say, eh, I'll tell you what, we're just going to decide the election on behalf of everyone. And if you think that's wrong, screw you because you're not a state legislature and your name isn't in the constitution over here. You see what's going on? It's a very weird and overly flexible theory. And that might not even be the biggest thing that's wrong with it. But there's a lot to it. Uh, right now, I've just gotten to the things uh, that Helen White uses to describe this thing with which I agree. Wait till we get to the things with which I don't agree. But that will have to wait, of course, for another day because next up, it's Justice Putnam in the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We're already there, two hours down. You have been listening to Kegro in the Morning with David Waldman. Well, Justice is going to take you back to that EPA court ruling, which, uh, in his view, will be focusing on a renewed focus on the state's power to rein in greenhouse gases. And, of course, researchers who want abortion misinformation... Oh, I'm sorry. They warned that abortion misinformation will only get worse. I think we could have guessed that. Next. <laughs>